steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never His mercies come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never His come mercies to, never an end. to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in Him. Therefore I here at Valley Christian for online morning worship service. We are so glad that you've joined us this morning. Before we get started with our sermon, let's go to God in a word of prayer. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you this day. We thank you for your protection. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. And we just thank you for Jesus and his sacrifice and knowing that it's because of him that we can have a relationship with you. God, we ask that you open up our ears and our eyes and our hearts wide to the word that's going to be preached this morning. We ask, Lord God, that we can be quick to put into practice the things that we learn. Lord, forgive us for how we fall short and how we miss the mark. We know we need you, and that's why we pray. We know we need you, and that's why we seek out your word. We know we need you, and we ask that you will guide us today, that you will speak to our hearts, and that we might live life, that live life in a way that really glorifies you. God, we love you, and we thank you for the many blessings that you have given to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as many of you know, and if you're joining us for the first time, I'll let you know we have been going through the book of Matthew. Last week, we talked about the first part of Matthew chapter 15, where Jesus confronted the Pharisees and the teachers of the law that came from Jerusalem to challenge him on the fact that he did not follow the traditions of the elders. And from that, we learned that, hey, there are rules, there are rituals, and there are traditions that we can often set up that compete or supersede God's word in our lives. And the challenge is to really understand what God says or what Jesus says when he, does, he says he desires mercy, not sacrifice. Ultimately, God's word needs to have the power and authority and rule in our lives over the things that we create, over our traditions. Um, we need to make sure that we are building uh, relationships that really last, relationships that are based off of love and righteousness and mercy and grace. We have to be all about relationship and not all about just rules and traditions and rituals. I think they have their place in our life. They have their place in our relationship with God, but they cannot supersede God's word. And they cannot become barriers by which we separate ourselves from the very people that may need Christ. We have to be bridge builders and not barrier builders. And, and that was at the heart of the message of Matthew 15, part one. But I want us to see that that set the scene because by Jesus going to challenge the Jews from Jerusalem or the Pharisees and the teachers of law from Jerusalem and saying, hey, these washing rituals that separate you from the Gentiles, that ostracize the Gentiles from you. Hey, these things aren't right because God wants to be the God of all nations. He wants to be the God of all people. And these things that you have set up really prevent you from reaching out to the very ones that need God. Now, this is important because this whole time, the disciples of Jesus, they're watching their rabbi. They're watching him operate. They're watching him uh deliberate and, and, and really have discussion with these Pharisees who represented the hope of salvation, so to speak, for the first century Jew. And here Jesus is challenging the accepted standards and trying to get people back to follow God's word. And what we see is a beginning of breaking down barriers and building bridges that's going to lead to things that even the disciples probably couldn't even imagine. But yet Jesus in his ministry previous to this time alluded to or hinted to or foreshadowed what would be taking place. But before we get into Matthew chapter 15, part two, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever heard someone say, oh, that neighborhood has gone to the dogs or that restaurant has gone to the dogs or uh, that that school has gone to the dogs. You know what that means, right? That means that restaurant, that school, or that neighborhood is going downhill. It's getting worse. It's getting worse and worse. And that's where that phrase comes from is it's just saying, hey, it's not as good as it used to be. It was great at one point, but now it's just gone to the dogs. It's gotten worse in quality. Some people might feel like the economy has gone to the dogs, whatever they might feel. But that phraseology is very interesting because it reminds me of what uh, this message is sort of going to be about. Uh, the title of the lesson is Jesus has gone to the dogs. Now, 
Be careful. I'm not saying Jesus has gone down in quality. I am talking about literally Jesus has gone to the dogs. And as we study out this passage of scripture, you're going to understand what I mean by that. And just some a couple of things to be reminded about what Jesus has said previously in his ministry or what he has done previously in his ministry. In Matthew chapter 8, when Jesus was dealing with a Roman centurion to heal his servant, Jesus said in verse 10, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. And basically the centurion said, hey, Jesus, you don't have to come to my house. You could just say the word and my servant will be healed. I, I too am a man under authority. I, I tell this person to go here. I tell this person to go there and they do it. So this man, this Roman centurion had this faith in Jesus that simply he believed, hey, Jesus, if you say it, it will be done. And that's what amazed Jesus. When he says, truly, I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus gave some indication about the direction of where his ministry was going, going to head because of his proclamation of the kingdom of God. He said those from the east and the west, those are the, the, the Gentile, those, those are symbolic of the Gentile people, people who, who aren't necessarily Israelites, that they are going to come and feast in the kingdom. And we remember the episode where Jesus crossed over the Sea of Galilee into the Decapolis and healed the demoniac. And, and as a result, in casting out the, the demons, he cast them into the pigs and then the pigs jumped in the water. And the people of that town said, please leave, right? You're wreaking havoc on our economy. You're, 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 you're different. You're, you're strange. But we see in, I believe it's Mark chapter five, the demoniac wanted to go with Jesus, but instead he told that delivered person, hey, go to your oikos, go to your family, go to your people in the Decapolis, which is a, a region, and tell them what I have done. So this is all important to understand because we're going to see Jesus literally go to the dogs. In Matthew chapter 15, verse 21, after Jesus had confronted the, the religious leaders from Jerusalem, he says, leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. This is an intense passage of scripture. We see this intense interaction where Jesus leaves Jerusalem, where he leaves where he's been confronted and he's been, he's been challenged in that region. And he goes to a Gentile region, not necessarily to the city, but into that region to with, retreat and to withdraw, I believe, to just get away from the hustle and bustle and maybe even the controversy he was experiencing in the Jewish territory. Here comes this woman and her daughter is suffering from demon possession. And she cries out to, to Jesus, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. So there's this recognition that he is not a Gentile, but he is a Jew but not only just any Jew, but she recognizes him for being Jesus, for being more than just an average Jewish person. Now, Jesus 
from the story, didn't even acknowledge her to the point where the disciples, his disciples are annoyed. They're like, get rid of her. Now notice they didn't say, Jesus, heal her daughter. Give her what she needs. They're, get rid of her. Send her away. Do something. And Jesus begins a conversation with her. And he tells her, I was only sent to the lost sheep of Israel. And she begged him and, and pleaded with him, Lord, help me. She knelt before him. So you can imagine the risk on her part to kneel before this Jew who had been ignoring her up to this point, who just told her that he hasn't been sent to her or her people or her kind. Matthew describes her as a Canaanite. There hasn't been really Canaan in, in, in a long time, but the fact that he names her as a Canaanite is an indication of really the, the separation racially and ethnically and culturally that she was from the Jews. And she, she knelt before him and Jesus says something intense. He says, it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Now for us, man, that's harsh. And I'll tell you this, it was probably harsh back then too. The only difference is this is the, the word for dogs here is not necessarily those stray running the streets dogs, but it's more of a diminutive dog. Maybe a, a, a dog that's around the house or some, I'm not going to say go as far as saying a household pet, but a diminutive dog, maybe a smaller dog, maybe a dog that is not looked at as filthy and dirty completely. And because there's another word for that kind of street running, dirty, filthy, immoral person dog. And that's not the term he uses here. And she says, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. She went toe to toe with Jesus. Now, if you're a mother out there and you, you've ever gone to bat for your children, you'll go toe to toe with anybody. It doesn't matter. That's your child. And you want the best with your child and nobody, not even the son of God, is going to stop you from getting the help that your child needs. And this woman had that attitude. And he says to her, woman, your faith is great and your request is granted. Now, it's interesting because, again, she's identified as a Canaanite woman. But in, in ancient times, Canaan was a territory and was made up of seven different nations, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, and the Girgashites. And, and this is going to play later on in the story. But suffice it to say right here, this woman had great faith. What is it that made this woman have great faith? Number one, she was desperate. She was a mother that was out for the best for her child. She was persistent. She did not take no for an answer. She kept going after to the point where even the disciples were like, Jesus, send her away. She had reasoned out her faith, which means she probably thought to herself, if I can just get to Jesus, maybe she heard about Jesus. Maybe she heard about Jesus from this former demoniac. Maybe, maybe she, she heard stories and rumors and realized this is the guy. And if he can heal that guy, and I maybe heard things from the, the Jewish territories, then he for sure can heal my daughter. She reasoned in her faith. And then lastly, she put all her hope in Jesus. I believe in her mind and in her heart, there was no other answer. There was no other option. It was going to be Jesus or nothing. That faith Jesus described is great. What's the condition of your faith? Is when you approach God and, and you're praying and you're asking, is there an under, is there a desperation? Number one, is the thing that you're praying for really something that you really, 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 really want or need or desire? Or is there persistence or is there, oh, I prayed about it, but I'm not very passionate about it. Well, Sometimes we pray about things that we're not passionate about and we're not persistent. We're not desperate. Trust me, Jesus was blown away at this woman's faith to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him 
and to reason in her faith, hey, even the dogs get the scraps. Where's your faith today? Is all your hope in Jesus? Now, I want us to see something important. Her faith either caused a pivot in Jesus' ministry or it marked the beginning of Jesus intentionally reaching out to the Gentiles from here on out in his ministry. Some would argue Jesus really meant he was only supposed to go to the Israelites and that that encounter with the woman enlightened Jesus, so to speak, because he was fully human and fully God, uh, broadened his horizon, so to speak. Jesus learned something. It does mention in the Bible that Jesus learned obedience or learned uh, submission um, through suffering. So I believe that's in Hebrews chapter five. Um, so some people believe that this encounter really opened up Jesus's eyes. Hey, I'm going to go to the Gentiles as well. Others believe Jesus was always going to the Gentiles, but he used this incident to show his disciples that the mission wasn't only to Jews. Because when he sent them out initially, he sent them only to the lost sheep of Israel, to the Jews. And they, in their minds, might have thought this gospel of the kingdom is only for Jews. And now he sees Jesus interact with this woman and realize, whoa, Jesus just blessed this woman who is a Gentile. I know he did it with the Roman centurion. I know he did it with the man possessed. But now he specifically met this woman's need who asked him for a favor in their backyard. Maybe Jesus did this to teach them and to show them and to expand their horizons that the message wasn't only to Gentiles, I mean Jews, but was also meant for Gentiles. Let's go on, verse 29. Jesus left there and went along the Sea of Galilee. Then he went up on a mountainside and sat down. Now, let me just say something. In Mark chapter 7, verse 31, it's a parallel passage describing a similar, the same scene. It says, then Jesus, in verse 31, left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon down to the Sea of Galilee into the region of the Decapolis, which means Jesus was still in Gentile territory. So you can read Matthew and think, oh, he's up in the, the, the Jewish triangle, but Beth, Beth, Bethsaida and Capernaum and Galilee and stuff. No, he went to the region or the area of the Decapolis where the Gentiles were. He's in their territory. And so in verse 30 of Matthew chapter 15, great crowds came to him, bringing the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others, and laid them at his feet. And he healed them. The people were amazed when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled made well, the lame walking, and the blind seeing. And they praised the God of Israel. Now let's just sit back and let that sink in. Jesus goes to the Decapolis. He's met with great crowds. They, they come to him. So Jesus didn't go to the crowd. The crowds came to him. We see that played out in the Jewish territories as well. They bring the blind, the crippled, the mute, the lame, and they laid them at his feet. Now, in the Greek, the, the laid isn't some gentle laying. Down. It's, it's almost like they threw, threw them at his feet, meaning like, hey, we are giving you these, these people. Do something. We hear about the miracles going on in Jerusalem that you are performing. Do something for us. I believe these people, like the woman, were desperate for Jesus his power, and he healed them. The people were amazed at all that he did. They saw the crippled mute speaking, the crippled made well, the lame walking and the blind seeing, and what did they do? And they praised the God of Israel. This is how it's more than likely he was in Gentile territory because of this last phrase. 
But I wanted to do something interesting, and it's just a little exercise, is comparing the crowds, the Gentile crowd versus the Galilean crowd or the Jewish crowd. In Matthew 14, verse 13, the description of the crowd goes like this. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. And then we just read what went on with the Gentile crowds. Same Jesus, same power, same result. Jesus didn't change into something else because he was, or, or change what he would do because he was with the Gentiles versus to the Jews or the Jews versus the Gentiles. Same Jesus meeting needs. And the, the thing that's absent from 1413 is, and they praise their God. Now, I believe they praise God. I believe they, they worship God. I believe they attributed it to God. But remember, Jesus was accused by some of being, of working by the power of the devil. For the Gentiles, wasn't even a thought. They praised God. So it's an interesting thing. There's some similarities, but there are some differences in the crowd. And I, I want to say something about the crowds that we will encounter in our comings and going. There's a religious crowd that, like the crowd in Jerusalem, know about Jesus, know about God, and we argue theology. We argue doctrine. We argue this, that, and the other. And we spend a lot of time and energy talking about a lot of things about Jesus instead of talking a lot of things about what Jesus has said. But there's another crowd that we're going to encounter. And that's a crowd that's just not religious. We have to present to them Jesus. And show them Jesus in all his glory of not the doctrine, not the theology, not the sacrifice, but showing the love and the mercy, the grace and the willingness to sacrifice, to die, to rise again for them so that they can praise the God of Israel. You see, it's super important that we Understand there are two different crowds. It's the same Jesus, but it might be a little bit of a different conversation. Notice it didn't say that Jesus preached this long sermon to them. He went up on a hill like he went up on a hill with the Jews. He would give sermons to the Jews and for the Gentiles, he demonstrated power. I think for us, the demonstration of power to the non-religious is a changed life. And if you're a disciple of Jesus, I guarantee you, your life has changed. And that's what we share to the crowd that is not religious, but a crowd that is looking for truth and power. And that power is found in Jesus Christ. Let's look at Matthew chapter 15, verse 32 through 34. Jesus called his disciples to him and says, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry or they may collapse on the way. His disciples answered, where could we get enough bread in this remote place to feed such a crowd? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven, they replied, and a few small fish. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground. Then he took the seven loaves and the fish. And when he had given thanks, he broke, broke them and gave them to the disciples. And they in turn to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. Afterward, the disciples picked up seven baskets full of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was 4,000 men, besides women and children. After Jesus had sent the crowd away, he got into the boat and went to the vicinity of Magadan. Now, this is intense. This, this is a separate miracle than the feeding of the 5,000. How do we know this? He wasn't in Jewish territory. He was in Gentile territory. He spent three, three days with them. Now, I just want us to see some things about his disciples. Jesus 
remember, not too long ago, according to Matthew and maybe the chronology, is he fed 5,000 people besides women and children, 5,000 men besides women and children. They are in a similar scenario with Gentiles. And Jesus is saying, hey, I have compassion on these people. Notice Jesus had compassion on the Jewish people too, but he had compassion on the Gentile. And he says, hey, I don't want to send them away because they might faint along the way. And instead of his disciples saying, well, Jesus, you fed 5,000, maybe up to seven or 8,000 people just a little while ago, just do the same thing. I think one of the reasons why they didn't even suggest that is because these are Gentiles. And those miracles are reserved for the Jewish people, for the special people, for the chosen people. Good things can't happen for the Gentiles because they're Gentiles. God doesn't work in the life of a Gentile because they're Gentiles. I submit to you, God works in the life of everybody. It doesn't mean everybody's saved. It doesn't mean everybody has a relationship with God that he desires. I believe that God works in everybody's life. My Bible tells me that it rains on the wicked and the righteous. The sun shines on the wicked and the righteous. Food tastes just as good to the wicked and the righteous and is, and is sustenance to both of them. I believe God works in everybody's life because God loves everybody. But his disciples didn't clue in. Hey, Jesus, you fed 5,000 men. Just feed these guys. They were like, son, I don't know where they're going to get food. I, I, we, we can't do anything. So Jesus has to say, okay, guys, what, what do we have in terms of food? Seven loaves and some fish. Now, Jesus worked with five loaves and two fish with the 5,000, and he's working with seven loaves and some fish, a few fish here. So, and, and Jesus works an incredible miracle again. And I think his disciples are still are shocked that Jesus would do a similar miracle for Gentiles. So let's look at this table where Jesus is feeding the 5,000 versus feeding the 4,000. And again, these are men besides women and children. So feeding the 5,000, there are five loaves. And many believe that those five loaves correspond to the five books of Moses. Because numbers are, are symbols to many Jewish uh, readers and should be, if, if it's to them and significant, then it should be significant to us because it's a Jewish audience reading Matthew. And so he has seven loaves with feeding the 4,000. And there were seven Canaanite nations that were driven out of the promised land. He had two fish. Well, the Ten Commandments were written on two stone tablets. He had a few fish. Well, that's not necessarily significant. That's why there's not a number associated with it. After they fed and everyone was satisfied after feeding the 5,000, there were 12 baskets of leftovers that many believe represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And after feeding the 4,000, there were seven baskets of leftovers representing the seven nations of the Canaanites. Or some people might even associate it with the fact that Jesus completes the mission of reaching Jew and Gentile, that, that seven baskets is completion. May he completely reach the Gentile nations. And what's the conclusion of feeding the 5,000 men? Jesus can completely meet the needs of Israel. There's enough of God's word, God's laws and decrees to feed all of Israel. There's enough of Jesus supplying power to uh, Jesus, there's enough of Jesus' power to meet the needs completely of the Gentiles. What we see here is Jesus showing his disciples God is the God of all nations. Why does Jesus have to teach him this particular lesson, maybe at this particular time in their ministry? Well, we know the end of the story of Matthew chapter 28, where Jesus says, go into all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. 
all nations. Jesus demonstrated that in his own ministry. And so Jesus set the example, hey, God works in the lives of the Jews and the Gentiles. God wants to be the God of the Jews and the Gentiles, an important lesson. Now, here's full circle. He didn't feed 10,000 men. He fed 4,000, fewer men, and maybe fewer people with bread that was supplied by his disciples who were Jews. So Jesus took the bread from the children of Israel and from it fed the dogs. See, Jesus went to the dogs. Jesus played out in his ministry that scene, that word picture that was created between he, he and that woman. The disciples heard it and now the disciples lived it. That's the power of God's word. That's the awesomeness of God's word. How should we feel about it? We should be amazed. We should be fired up because God wants to meet the needs of all people and he wants all men to be saved. But what is it gonna take for us to not be like the disciples, slow to learn, slow on the uptake? Because I'm sure they still didn't get fully completed and, and later on in Mark and later on in Matthew, we're gonna see they don't completely get it still. But what is it gonna take for us what is it going to take on our part to see that we get the word out to the crowds that may not know Jesus? Number one, it's having a faith that is totally reliant on Jesus. Why do we pray? Why do we read our word? Why do we go after being sharpened and being made more like Jesus? Because we rely on Jesus. It's not about our power and our strength and our goodness and our talent. It's about Jesus. Number two, it takes compassion. See, Jesus had compassion for both the Jew and the Gentile. He had compassion to meet their physical and spiritual need. I believe in those three days Jesus preached. I, I can't prove it, but I'm thinking, I don't know if he just healed people for three days, but they probably had some sort of conversation because he had compassion on them. He met their physical and spiritual need. He showed them good works. We need to show people good works. I appreciate Hope Las Vegas, Cheryl and Tara working hard to make sure that as a church, we have a presence in the community of serving the needy. And I pray that we take advantage of November 30th, the day of giving for Hope Worldwide, which is the international benevolent organization, which is an international benevolent organization. I pray we take advantage of Toys for Tots and, and, and the Giving Tree, I believe, and, or Angel Tree, and, and really participate in these things as much as possible. And if we can't physically be there, donate, give. Why? Because in Mark Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, Jesus says, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. When Jesus showed the good deeds of healing, it resulted in the praise and glory of the God of Israel. We need to show good works. And finally, we need to show them that the following of teaching, the following the teachings of Jesus changes life for the better. See, rules and regulations is not what Jesus seeks. He seeks relationship. But those the how to have that relationship is described in the teachings of Jesus. And by showing our lives to people, sharing our lives with people, doing good deeds for people, having compassion on people, totally relying on Jesus, for these people, I believe it's going to result in life-changing ministry. Remember, it's not a matter of becoming something that you're not. This is about being who God has made you to be. An imperfect person serving a perfect God. 
People don't have to be impressed by us. People should always be impressed by God. And what's the best way to help people be impressed by God? It's through showing them what God can do with a broken life like ours. He rescues us. He saves us. He cleans us up and he sends us out. And this isn't all about, oh, you just got to go make this happen. You just got Jesus calls us to love. First love him, then love people. And then he called his people to go make disciples. Let me just say something to the Valley Christian Church. That's got to be our heart. Love God, love people, and go make disciples. Why? Because we have a mission on this earth that is driven by our purpose of our relationship with God, of having a relationship with God, being his son, being his daughter. And while on earth, being his ambassador. And let me speak to you if you don't have a relationship with God. It would be easy for me to say, just believe. But believe what? <laughs> this is just one message. We would love to sit down and open up the scriptures with you to show you so you can see yourself what God's desire and plan is for your life so that you can make a faith-filled decision to truly follow him, to love God, to love people, and to go make disciples yourself. Please contact us through the app or through the web website. We would love to spend time with you to get you into some Bible studies so that you can make a decision for yourself. Thank you this morning for tuning in. And remember, we are an imperfect people serving a perfect God. And because of that, I believe this world can be one for him. To God be the glory. God bless and have a great week. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. 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 And He, and he will, lift will lift you up. And He, and he will, lift will lift you up. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. 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 That saved that a, wretch, a wretch like me. That saved, that saved a, wretch a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. 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 Was blind, was blind but, now but now I see. Was blind, was blind but, now but now I see. When we've been there ten thousand years. When we've been there ten thousand years.
Good morning, church. My name is Dan Triana, and I have the privilege uh, to share a scripture this morning to prepare us for uh, taking the Lord's Supper. And in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 2, the New Living Translation reads, Remember how the Lord your God led you through the wilderness for these 40 years, humbling you and testing you to prove your character and to find out whether or not you would obey his commands. In the NIV, it reads, Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would obey whether you would keep his commands. Uh, you know, communion is a very sacred time to remember what the Lord has accomplished for us on the cross. And I uh, kind of wanted to compare and contrast what it would have been like to be part of God's people uh, under Moses' leadership. And at that time, what God provided for them to draw near to him was the, the Ten Commandments. And Moses came down from Mount Sinai and shared them with them, and, and uh, they celebrated knowing that they had laws to govern them and to set them apart and distinguish them from the other nations uh, so they can be considered God's people. But I think that if they were to have communion, they would reflect on their lives from day to day, week to week, um, and monitor how they were doing with obeying the commandments. And I, I would imagine that from week to week, they would have felt like they would have continually fallen short. And what we learn in the New Testament is that even though the law was holy and good and perfect, uh, man uh, collectively or individually could not measure up and they would feel guilty and condemned from week to week. And so the great news is that Jesus has come on the scene and is now our leader. And now the cross of Christ is what we look to. And what Jesus has shared is that he didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill it. And so now we can see uh, through the cross of Christ, the love of God and uh, the sacrifice that Jesus was willing to make. Uh, he lived his life perfectly on this earth and laid his life down willingly uh, in order to make provisions for us so that we can feel freedom from day to day, from week to week. And as he laid down his life, uh, all of us have had an opportunity to uh, lay down our lives in response to his leadership and give us a chance to follow him. And uh, so as we take communion this morning, let us rejoice in the salvation that we share. Let us celebrate um, the victory uh, of what Jesus has done for us and what God has accomplished for us. Let us remember how much God loves us, uh, no matter our performance. You know, we can reflect on our journey and there's been times where we feel like we've been on point. There's been times where we feel like we've been mediocre. There's been times we probably felt like we were down and out and in the pit uh, spiritually, but God's love for us doesn't change regardless of our performance. God's love for us is constant and let that motivate us to know that God is in our corner. God is our biggest fan and God has already accomplished for us, um, what is needed for us to be back home with him. So uh, let us pray as we remember um, the bread that represents the body of Christ and the juice that represents the blood of Christ that was shed upon the cross. Uh, let that continue to uh, motivate us. Let it continue to help us to celebrate. Let us uh, continue to uh, just be grateful in our hearts. And as we take communion, let us express uh, in a meditative way uh, what we're grateful for uh, this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much, Father, for your son and his leadership and his life uh, and his death and his resurrection, Father. It is just a, an amazing um story to embrace it's an amazing amazing fact to embrace and uh, father let that uh this morning help us to rejoice recount all the things that we're thankful for 
all the things that you have done to get our attention, all the people you've put in our path uh, to help us to listen to the message and give us a chance to respond. Father, uh, I pray for Father everyone's faith that, Father, you would help us to, um, no matter where we, we think we're at, God, that uh, you would strengthen us from within and that your Holy Spirit, Father, would uh, truly continue to take hold of us, transform us, and finish what you started in our lives. Uh, Father, help uh, the cross of Christ be our uh, lifelong motivation to persevere in our walk with you. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us. We are so glad that you did. If you want more information about Valley Christian, please go to valleychristians.org. That's valleychristians with an S dot org. There you can find more information about us. You can sign up for Bible studies. You can get more information about small groups around the valley if you would like. And you're also able to give online if you would like to do that as well. Again, we are an imperfect people serving a perfect God. Let's journey together. God bless, and we'll see you next time.